so excited. all right yeah, this one works out all right thank you thank you for being patient i really appreciate it hey jenna dr hua great to see you thanks for inviting me thanks for including me no thank you so much for your time and it was like a lot of awkward silence and i keep having to turn it off and then like to turn it back on so i'm so glad everything works out thank yeah thank you so much well, it's, um, it's great to be here as always, or as you know, it's so fun to, you know, be talking with you and this is the first time you and I are doing an Instagram live together. So, you know, I appreciate it, even though you and I have talked many times before. Right, right, right. So I'm super excited. I gave a little bit of introduction. I mentioned that you're a board certified, uh, reproductive endocrinologist at HRC fertility in LA and HRC is, uh, one of the, the leading fertility clinic in a, in a nation. So, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and why you became a, a reproductive endocrinologist. Yeah. So, um, like you, you said, um, I'm with HRC Fertility here in Los Angeles area. Um, and why did I become a reproductive endocrinologist? Gosh, um, it, it sort of gets back to why did I become a doctor? Um, a lot of it is a kid. Um, I always enjoyed science. But I also very much enjoyed working with people, helping people. And um, the reason for reproductive endocrinology, I started to figure out what I liked and what I didn't like in medical school. And I, I learned that I liked doing little procedures. Um, so I enjoyed, I was more of a, a surgical person, but um, I really also very much enjoyed the biology, the reproductive endocrinology that goes into our field and also the interplay with genetics and um, and that it's a field that's still developing and we're still very much learning. So so that's sort of how I ended up in reproductive endocrinology. And then I love just helping people add and build uh, their families, add to their families, build their families. So what's like the exact definition for reproductive endocrinology? Uh, endocrinologist? Like when do a person need to see like a, a reproductive endocrinologist? Yeah, so reproductive endocrine, so there is, as we know in medicine, there's um, just internal medicine, which has a subspecialty of endocrinology, which is dealing with hormones. So those tend to be more thyroid, more vitamin, um, more uh, um, diabetes, even, um, you know, growth hormone, things like that, cortisol. Um, with reproductive endocrinology, we focus more on the, the male and female reproductive hormones. So those are going to be not just estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, but also the communicator hormones. So follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, uh, human chorionic gonadotropin, you know, so all this interplay of pituitary and hypothalamic uh, hormones. Um, yeah. So when do a person needs to see a, 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 endo, a, a reproductive endocrinologist? Yeah, or a fertility specialist. That's what, you know, my partner tells me, you know, John, you should really just tell people you're a fertility specialist when it comes down to it. Um, I love the biology of reproductive endocrine, but it's a mouthful. God, how many syllables are in that word? Right. Um, but um, so I tell the women who are in their younger 30s or in their 20s, if you've been trying to conceive for um, over six over 12 months then you really really should be reaching out to someone just to sort of break the seal and get a little bit more information i know i just said six months because i know in our textbooks it says at age 35 and under wait 12 months honestly if you've been trying nine months 10 months and you haven't had success the idea of doing some hormone testing checking the sperm just doing some basic um uh information um that's really helpful so uh, that's what I would say. Also, if you're over 35 and you've been trying for six months, definitely reach out to someone. But also, this information is uh, not even um, just for fertility. It's also good for your personal health, wellness, understanding your hormones and your levels. Um, that would also play a role too, right? Oh my gosh, without a doubt. And remember, like as a fertility specialist, I usually am always running a woman's uh, thyroid level, her vitamin D level. Um, and to be fair, um, fertility issues themselves are predictive of other life outcomes. So we know that guys who are struggling with male fertility stuff 
they that's important for their possibility of developing metabolic syndrome, uh, heart disease, you know, stroke, heart heart attack, things like that at an earlier age than maybe they would have had otherwise. So we pick stuff up that's also important for a person's life um, throughout. Absolutely. So endocrine system is like super complicated. I always uh, love doctors to, to explain because you guys explain so much better than like a scientist explaining endocrine system. So what is the endocrine system? Yeah, so the endocrine system. So remember, there's lots of body systems. There's a cardiovascular system. There's the pulmonary, the lung, the you know the heart, the lung, the kidneys, uh, the bones. So the endocrine system and a hormone is basically any compound that can stimulate the reaction uh, where it binds to a receptor. And there's lots of different types of re receptors that then stimulates an action downstream. So um, we classically think of, let's say, insulin. So insulin comes along to a cell, it binds a receptor, and then it allows the intake of glucose, of sugar. Um, and it also, believe it or not, insulin's a really important hormone. It, it plays a role in the transport of many other things in and out of cells and, um, and that sort of thing. It, it also plays a role with fat metabolism, of course. So that's, hormones are these little packets of transport information that moves around through the body and they're targeted. So they're targeted to certain cells. So um, there may be a cell on the surface of the heart that plays a role or the pancreas or um, a fat cell, adipose cell. So that, that's where these hormones really come into play. For me, I love when they go to the ovary or they go to the testicles because I'm a fertility guy, right? And that's how I help develop good eggs and good sperm that's what we do and ultimately that helps us make better embryos right so it's like super intricate so like then how does the how does all these intricate hormones in, influence fertility in particular you mentioned about uh, ovaries and testes right and you bring up a good point they're super intricate one other big thing that i i like to tell people is that hormones um themselves are super potent, right? They're very strong. Um, they're at very, very small concentrations in the body. They're at picograms per milliliter, nanograms per milliliter. Nanogram is 10 to the minus ninth. Pico, I think, is 10 to the minus 12th um, per milliliter. So, you know, I talk to my buddies who are internal medicine guys, and they're like very stressed about like a sugar level. But that's like a milligram per deciliter. I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> that's like not that powerful. Like, these hormones are just crazy, super powerful, and, um, and, and they play, play a big role. So they're hugely interconnected, though, right? And that's what I, I very much love. I mean, I remember, gosh, in fellowship and even now, I mean, within the hypothalamus, right? So it goes, you know, there's the hypothalamus, and then below it is the pituitary, and there's the front part of the pituitary and the anterior and the posterior. There's like little packets of tissue that have this delicate interplay. Within the pituitary, there's like eight, nine main hormone centers, fertility hormones, thyroid hormones, growth hormones, cortisol hormones, bone hormones, pitocin hormones, you know, like all this stuff. And all these guys, they like to talk to each other. So you, you, and believe it or not, like opiate receptor, right? People taking lots of pain medications, they will then impact each of those other hormone centers. So we know that like, here's an example, a person taking lots of pain medication, lots of uh, stimulating the opiate receptor, the mu receptors, that men don't produce as good sperm and women don't ovulate as weather as well because of this delicate interplay crosstalk within these these hormone centers. This is so incredible. And I love the analogy when you compare it to like blood sugar, like just the magnitude is so different um, for these hormones compared to, you know, blood sugar. So then how, um, how come everyday chemicals can become uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals? Right. So, so remember I was telling you that hormones sort of move around the body. They go to the cells and things like that. So endocrine disruptors. 
So these are compounds that can disrupt the way a hormone works. So sometimes they're like what we call like an imposter hormone, right? Or an imposter chemical. And what they do, they may bind to that receptor, right? So they're good, but then they do a whole lot of nothing. They just hang out. They don't do anything. So then the body needs to compensate for it. So then the body may rev up, let's say insulin. Let's say you have an imposter hormone, right? It's hanging out on the pancreas or, or like on a fat cell, a muscle cell. And it's sitting on the insulin receptor, but doing a whole lot of nothing, right? That's not good because then the way the body compensates is that it makes more insulin. And more insulin for that muscle tissue or, you know, fat cell, then in the body, the body starts swimming in insulin. And then insulin, if there's too much of it, can cause other problems. So imposter hormones, they bind the receptor, they do nothing. They also, these endocrine disruptor toxins or chemicals can also alter transport, how fast stuff gets in and out of the cell or um, how slow something gets in and out of the cell. So to disrupt the speed, let's say using that glucose example, how much glucose can sort of come in and out of the cell. Otherwise, how fast compounds are broken down, degradation, mm -hmm. right? So these darn toxins, they can also sit on the receptors, rev up the degradation process. They rev up the lysosome. That's the trash compactor of these cells. Um, or they just retain hormone, right? So like women who really struggle, struggle with PCOS, a lot of times, remember our adipose tissue, hangs on to a weak form of estrogen, estrone, right? And that's not so great because weak levels of estrogen, people become hyperestrogenic, right? And then you get other problems on the back end that we might talk about. But then if you have like way too much um, estrogen sort of lingering, then you get other issues. So if things are stored inappropriately, that's not great. And then also just the sensitivity. Like how that you these these chronic low level toxins can mess up our sensitivity to hormone. Wow, that's super comprehensive. I love it. Uh, so besides the the hormone disrupting chemical, these environmental toxins, what are other factors can also influence the endocrine system, like everyday factors? Right. So we talked about um, so endocrine disruptors, but other factors. Um, uh, a person's weight, right? Let's say a person's eating super, super clean. If a woman's too thin or too heavy, then she may not ovulate as well, right? Um, same with guys. Um, other toxins, um, they may not just disrupt our hormones, but they also may like get into the egg or get into the sperm so the egg quality may not be as great. So you talk about like, like the process of meiosis, right? I, I don't want to do too deep a dive here, but um, is remember you and I, Jenna, Dr. Roy, we, you and I were 46 chromosomes, right? 46 XX, 46 XY, right? But then our eggs and sperm have 23 and 23. So there's this process of pulling apart our chromosomes. So remember a chromosome is like an X, and you pull apart the X, it's like a sister chromatid. So sort of like this, it's my X. And then these guys, that goes to the egg and one, and then this sort of thing. Anyways, the reason why I bring up all this stuff is if you're exposed to other toxins, that pulling apart mechanism may not be as great. And then you lead to other problems with egg quality. People also talk about the ends of the DNA. I know this is a little wonky, but like the telomeres. Yeah. Um, so the ends of our DNA, remember our DNA are like miles upon miles of like Gattaca. Remember that old movie from like the 80s or 90s? Yeah. Like G's, A's, T's, and C's. It's like human code, right? I know all these um, computer programmers, they get all excited about, you know, zeros and ones, but I'm like, whatever, you only got two numbers. I got four, yeah. right? So um, so the, the thing is, whoever designed humans, we protected our strands of DNA. And we put these things called telomeres on. And as age goes on, as toxin exposure happens, our telomeres shorten and our DNA, when we recombine or we 
redevelop ourselves and go through mitosis, not meiosis, but we're just reproducing a cell that is not as great. The, the nucleus doesn't um, transcribe as well. Which everything you said made it really important, especially for people who are trying to conceive, right? It's, it's had to do with their egg quality, their sperm quality, their embryo quality, and which makes this imbalance of the hormone become super, super crucial that we actually want the hormone to be balanced. Without a doubt. I mean, I remember one of my mentors would, would say, you know, having a period is like another vital sign because it's this delicate interplay between um, hormones in our pituitary, uh, you know, in our brain, talking to our ovaries, talking to our uterus. So it's not an easy thing to have a regular period. And, um, and then when we, you know, it's hard enough as it is. And then if we start adding in these other insults, then it, it gets that bit more tricky. Right. And I know you've done like a lot of research too, and then super well published, like 25 peer reviewed papers. Like, have you done anything related to EDCs or other hormone imbalance studies? So it's a great question. I would love to. This is like an area of research that I'm like actively interested in. I have like a couple of study ideas that I think that we really could answer. Um, I was actually talking to Jorge Chavarro, a great guy, PhD out of um, the Boston area, has done a lot of work with the nurses health study and really is curious about nutrition's impact. So I've got some really interesting um, ideas about this nutrition and toxin exposure for getting a sense of sperm health. To answer your question shortly, um, I have in the sense of a lot of my work, if you're bored, please, please go on Google Scholar or go on PubMed. One of my, my main mentors was this guy, Jim Seegers. He's still alive. Dr. Seegers, awesome gentleman, got awesome clinician scientist. That's really what he is. I was at the NIH for fellowship. It was like a hotbed of, of activity. In what we are looking at is uterine fibroids and looking at the subcellular sub sub signaling pathway. And what we were looking at is the extracellular matrix. So fibroids are these fibrotic conditions where we think that things get dysregulated and the cell starts pooping out, excuse my language, more, fi more fibrous tissue. And then the, the outside, this, the extracellular matrix gets totally disorganized. And then you just have all this fibrous, fibrous, fibrous material around it. And People in our lab were looking at things like curcumin. They were looking at um, uh, resveratrol. They were looking at nutritional supplements that may play a role in fibrosis. We were looking at it from a mechanical point of view. Um, and so, so I have a better sense of like TGF beta 3. Um, we were looking at some of the fibroid stuff from um, like anti inflammatory, decreased inflammation, cause less fibrosis. So. Anyway, it's sort of interesting. Anyways. No, it's super interesting. And it's also very actionable, like, because once you study the mechanism and then you, you figure out the solution, then women with fibroids, then they could have solutions, you know, either increasing resveratrol or other supplement intake could help them. So this is, this is super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't doing that myself. Other people in the lab were, but but, it, you know, the really fun thing, Jenna, is people are, you know, I was in medical, you know, I'm an MD. Dr. Seeger, MD, but we had some cool ideas. And Jim, myself, we're curious people. And um, now we get the backbone of industry sort of following up on some of our like our mechanical studies. And it's really cool because there may be um, other things we learn. And that's why funding research and NIH and things like that, grants are just so important. So I'm going to leave it there. But uh, Love it. Love it. Um, because in your bio, you also mentioned you provide high level individualized fertility care for all. So what does that mean to you? I know I already know what it means to you, but I want you to explain it. Yeah, no, I mean, what it is, is you have a dedicated doctor or a dedicated nurse guiding you through the process. So walking the walk of fertility is no fun, right? So I do night, essentially all my own egg retrievals, my own transfers. Um, we have a wonderful team of coordinators here guiding you through the process, um, setting up calendars, supporting you and, um, and things like that. I, myself, I'm sort of chatty. So I sort of narrate as I go, 
So you have an idea when the doctor, when me or our technician, when we're doing the ultrasound, you know what we're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I was a little late today, and again, I'm sorry, is I was doing a lot of ultrasounds this morning. So that's where, um, you know, uh, and, and I think what, what I was just mentioning is that's what drives our success rates, right? Mm -hmm. Having a dedicated person, not having as many handoffs, I think we do better with patient care. Because handoffs, even like super smart doctor to super smart doctor, stuff may not get uh, transmitted as well. I totally agree. And I love the explanation part because uh, I always remember going to doctors, they don't talk, they don't let you know what they're thinking and you keep thinking about what are they thinking, right? And especially during procedures and they, you don't see it, you don't feel it. So I, I, I think many patients would really appreciate that you're explaining as you're going through and doing the procedures. Right. Even at the initial visit, I make it, I'm a real nutrition one. And I, I talk to people about that, you know, at graduation, the one little thing I just want to sort of mention is, and, and I'd love to get your thoughts is, um, we talk about ways to sort of clean up our lives. Right. And especially when you're pregnant, because a lot of human tracts the remember the general ridge is formed typically between six and nine weeks, right? So that's ovaries and testicles are being formed around that time. I mean, of course, not completely, but some of the basic machinery is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for trying to avoid that chronic toxins, you know, like, and you do such a good job, Jenna, of that, you know, use more glass, use more metal, try to avoid plastics, never microwave plastic, for God's sakes. You know, you know, all those sort of simple, small wins um, those are huge. And uh, even makeups during pregnancy. I wear face cream because yeah, I'm in Southern California and I don't want to get skin cancer. And, um, and I'm trying to avoid wrinkles, of course. But uh, I have like smile wrinkles. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, totally okay. And, um, but, but again, you know, you just try to choose better products. And the part of it, when you're growing a human inside you, that potentially will decrease future disease for that baby. It's it, a lot of this came out of um, something called the Barker hypothesis. And, um, and that is now really giving us a lot, a lot of insight into chronic low level toxin exposure. Super well said. Um, so what's a, a potential patient uh, start onboarding? What do you look like? How do they how do they come to see you? Yeah, so basically you just give a call to our office. Um, we have an 866 number. Um, gosh, what is 866? What is it? HRC for IVF. I, or you um, call one of our offices and you schedule an appointment with me, with Dr. John Norian, and I'm with HRC, of course. And, uh, and then we set up um, ideally an in-person visit or a video call. We take care of people from around the world. And, um, and then we start making a plan. We talk about wellness, we talk about lifestyle, and we talk about how are we gonna generate the best quality egg, sperm, and embryos, and ultimately just get you pregnant as soon as we can. Because I know that when people walk in or before they schedule the appointment, they wanna be pregnant yesterday. So we, we get that. Yeah, and then also the consistency, I think that that's huge um, for people who are interested in working with HRC, because as Dr. Norian said, like he does a hand off, like, you're literally doing everything for your patients and that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we do have a wonderful team and, and we, you know, allow, you know, cause um, we can all only be in one place at one time, but we're here to support you and, and guide you. And um, yeah, it's fun. That's what we do. That's my life's work. So. Thank you so much for all this great information and joining us. So um, everyone, thank you for joining and then be sure to follow Dr. John North. And you cut out. I can't hear you. Perfect. So good. Yeah, there you go. But that's okay. Thanks so much. You know, Jenna, one thing for you, because I know you guys at Million Market have an awesome product. Patients are, you know, starting to use the test and getting reports back. Um, and they were, someone pinged me today about, uh, if, uh, is it, are there any promo codes? And I was like, oh my gosh, you got to talk to million marker because they're doing, they're trying to do the right thing and they're getting the word out and, and all that. So wonderful. Wonderful. We'll get those to you. Thank you so much. Awesome.
Take care. Have a great uh, rest of your day. You too. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.